Okay, good morning. Judges chapter 19. Judges chapter 19. Let's pray. Lord, again, we, we're thankful for your word. And again, we realize that the scripture says the entrance of your word brings light. So that's what we pray for today. Just uh, take your word and shine it into our hearts and help us uh, draw something from it that we can use to light our path as we follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Book of Judges, chapter 19. <clears throat> As I've uh, mentioned before, the last five chapters of this book, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21, are uh, kind of a supplement and an appendix to the history of the period of the Judges. Every 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 much inspired, very much inspired, as the rest of the scriptures are, but it's just, it's, uh, while the history, and I mentioned this before too, while the history of the events surrounding the life and times of the 13 judges was chronological, and we saw that was chronological, these last chapters in Judges are not. And so the events recorded. Uh, in those chapters actually occurred probably during the early period of the judges. And for example, the time of the account that we're going to look at here in chapter 19 this week and next week probably took place early in the period of the judges. And we can gauge that by the fact that uh, a priest by the name of Phineas, who was the grandson of Aaron, is mentioned in the 28th uh, verse of chapter 20, and we'll get to that. The 28th verse says, uh, And Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of my brother Benjamin, or shall I see? I see? So he's standing before the ark of the Lord, and... and uh, and doing the, the duties as a, as a priest. So that, that's how we can kind of date this, uh, this, this portion of Scripture. So let's look, at, let's look at chapter 19. You got it? Everybody got it? Chapter 9? Chapter 19? So <clears throat> right out of the box, now there's right at the outset, we're, we're, we are reminded that what's going to take place is taking place at a time when it says, and it came to pass in those days when there was no king in Israel. So there was no king in Israel. And because of that, the last verse in the book of Judges says, Be, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So that's what you... That's what you have the, here in almost the entire book of Judges. People are doing that which was right in their own eyes. And it's not a, it's not a whole lot different today. Okay? And a lot of times we, we uh, latch on to the scriptures and we say, okay, how can we apply this today? Well, people don't people aren't paying their allegiance primarily to the king of kings, by and large. They're, they're doing what's right in their own eyes. You know, it seems, it seems, seems right to me. And uh, it's amazing. Uh, I spent some time talking with some Christian folks. 
and I kind of use that term a little bit loosely, uh, yesterday a little bit. And uh, it's interesting how we justify sometimes what we do. And where we say, uh, well, my son or my daughter really loves Jesus. But, and they're involved in, in a lifestyle that's not pleasing to the Lord. And I said to one person, I says, you know, I just kind of went like this. And she says, you, you have a problem with what I just said? And I says, I kind of do. And I said, and I said it just like this. I says, I think the Bible kind of does. I think Jesus kind of does. Because Jesus said, if you love me, you'll what? Keep my commandments. One translation says, if you love me, you'll do what I tell you. See? And... Uh, and that's the key. I mean, and we tell the guys at the mission, guys will we'll fill out an application. And they list their drug use and everything like that. And then there's a slot where they say, okay, where they talk about uh, spiritual stuff. You know, uh, do you go to church regularly? What is your relationship to God? And, they'll, and invariably they'll put, I really love him. But yet, and, and, and I can get away with asking some of these guys questions that some of the other guys, staff members, can't get away with. And I'll say, okay, here you say that you're on all of these drugs and you've been in prison and you've been in jail and you just got out. But over here you say you really love God. Can you explain that to me? How does that balance out? Well, I guess it doesn't balance out. See, and. And so we have a tendency to justify our behavior. And we say, God understands. God understands what I'm doing. And uh, a lot of times my reply to them is, well, do you really understand what God wants you to do? And uh, then I get comments like, you shouldn't ask those questions. Well, anyhow, Everyone did right that which was right in his own eyes. Second part of this first verse of chapter 19. A certain Levite who was staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim, it says, took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. Now, I copied something down here simply uh, from what uh, a lesson that I had shared some time back. Um, and I just uh, went back to that message and clipped it out and put it here. It says, a concubine was a lawful wife who was guaranteed only food, clothing, and marital privileges. Any children she bore would be considered legitimate, but because of her second class status, they wouldn't necessarily share in the family inheritance. If a man's wife was barren, he sometimes took a concubine so he could establish a family. And though the law controlled this concubine setup, God did not approve or encourage it. Yet, and here's the interesting thing, you'll find several Old Testament men who had concubines, including Abraham, Jacob, Gideon, Saul, even David, and of course, Solomon. And just so you'll know, I do not have one. Do you have a concubine, Pastor? <laughs> David. The one thing all those guys had in common that you mentioned is they were all rich. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Did you hear what he said? One thing is that all those guys had in common, they were all rich. And so... Uh, kind of like a mistress, I guess. I don't know. But, uh, and this, this particular, yeah, Carol. As you were saying that before David spoke, Ruthie said, and look at all the trouble it caused him. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Solomon had a thousand wives. Go figure. Huh? He didn't like that. And I've always scratched my head 
when I, when I read that. I read it again not all that, that long ago as I was looking ahead to some of this stuff. And Solomon had all those wives, and, and he was supposed to be very smart, full of wisdom. And his, uh, the fellow from, what's his name, from, uh, oh, I can't even, and that's all I'm going to say about that. Yeah, Forrest Gump. So this particular con concubine was unfaithful to her husband. She fled to her father's house in Bethlehem for protection. And the longer she was gone, the more her husband, this Levite, missed her. So he traveled to Bethlehem, forgave her, and was reconciled to her. He and his father-in-law discovered they enjoyed each other's company. So they spent five days eating, drinking, making merry, and little did the Levite realize that down the road, he really had nothing to be happy about because tragedy was going to come upon him because of this concubine situation. Notice verses, uh, let me read on following here. There was no king in Israel, I mean, verse 1, that there was a, that there was a certain Levite staying in the remote mountains of Ephraim. He took for himself a concubine from Bethlehem in Judah. But his concubine played the harlot against him, went away from him to her father's house at Bethlehem in Judah, and was there four whole months. So her husband arose, went after her to speak kindly to her and bring her back, having his servant and a couple of donkeys with him. So she brought him into her father's house, and when the father of the young woman saw him, he was glad to meet him. Now his father-in-law, the young woman's father, detained him, and he stayed with him three days. So they ate and drank, and uh, he lodged there. Then it came to pass on the fourth day that they arose early in the morning, and he stood to depart. But the young woman's father said to his son-in-law, uh, Refresh your heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward go your way. So let's sit down and eat a little bit, and then you can go. So they sat down, and the two of them ate and drank together. Then the young woman's father said to the man, Please be content to stay all night, and let your heart be merry. In other words, let's get drunk together. And when the man stood to depart, his father-in-law urged him, so he lodged there again. Then he arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart, but the young woman's father said, Please refresh your heart. So they, they delayed until afternoon, and both of them ate. And when the man stood to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the young woman's father, said to him, Look, the day is now drawing toward evening. Please spend the night. See, the day is coming to an end. Lodge here that your heart may be merry. Tomorrow go your way early so that you may get home. However, the man was not willing to spend that night, so he rose and departed and came opposite Jebus, that is Jerusalem. Now, that's the story there. So on the evening of the fifth day, the Levite and his concubine traveled north, came to the city of Jabus, about six miles from Bethlehem. And it was a journey from where he was to that area of about a couple hours. And Jabus was named after the Jebusites which was a non-Hebrew or a non-Jewish people. And so not wishing to spend the night in a city of foreigners, as the scripture says, uh, the Levite was determined to reach either Gibeah or Ramah. So the travelers bypassed Jabus as the sun was going down, and they came to Gibeah. Now, notice, uh, let's start with verse 11. They were near Jabus, and the day was far spent. The servant said to his master, Come, please, and let us turn aside into the city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. But his master said to him, We will not turn aside here into a city of foreigners who are not of the children of Israel. We will go on to Gibeah. So that's what they did. And it says... So he said, um, 
So he said, verse 13, so he said to his servant, come, let us draw near to one of these places and spend the night in Gibeah or Ramah. And they passed by, went their way, and the sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. So they turned aside there to go into lodge in Gibeah. And when he went in, he sat down in the open square of the city, for no one would take them into his house to spend the night. Now, once inside the city, no one would take them into his house to spend the night. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So they sat down in the open square of the city, or the city square. And this, this, this area was a public gathering place just inside the entrance to the city. So kind of picture this in your mind, the city, and you get inside, and here's this public square. And in this area, business transactions took place. We see uh, different references to the city squares throughout the Old Testament and some even in the New Testament. So transaction, business transactions took place. Merchants sold their stuff. Legal matters were settled and people uh, visited friends. Now, it's of interest, I think, to note that the neglect, listen to me now, the neglect of the travelers is another indictment of the sin and complacency of this time. And here's why. Hospitality was a common custom and courtesy given to strangers. That's just the way they did that in, in that area, okay? And since, here's, here's what's interesting. Since the Levite had plenty of provisions for his party and his animals, he wouldn't have been a burden to anybody. Notice the scripture text in verses 14 and 15. And they passed by, went their way. The sun went down on them near Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. They turned aside there to go into Lodge in Gibeah. We just read this, but I'm repeating it again. And when he went in, he sat down in the open square of the city, for no one would take them into his house to spend the night. Now, notice verse 16. Just then, an old man came in from his work in the field at Evie, who also was from the mountains of Ephraim. He was staying in Gibeah, whereas the men of the place were, were Benjamites. So, um, I don't know really how to draw a, an application here, except to notice it in verse 17. And when he raised his eyes, he saw the traveler in the open square of the city, and the old man said, where are you going, and where do you come from? Mm. In Gibeah, and in a lot of cities throughout the Middle East, everyone coming into the city, in and out of the city, had to pass through this city square. And so, any needy stranger would have been noticed. Some of them carried perhaps even signs. Some of them didn't look too great. Some of them looked wearisome and, and their animals uh, looked like they hadn't been cared for. So they were, evidently they were, there were things that visible to the eye that they could see that they were needy. But the regular people of Gibeah passed by the strangers, and here's what I feel, with their eyes down. Because they're probably sitting on benches or something like that, and you get the picture that they just walked by. Didn't want to look. Didn't want to look. However, one old guy, a farmer, came into the city square, and the scripture says, he raised his eyes. That's very significant. That phrase is not in there by accident. Okay? He raised his eyes. John 4.35. Listen to this. John 
do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? We've heard this verse, haven't we? Those of us who have been around this stuff for a while. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. And I submit to you that today we as Christ followers need to raise our eyes and look at the fields around us in the regions of this community. People near us, next to us, next door, in the square, at the prison, up at the market, all over the place, are ready to be saved. They're ready to be saved. Sometimes, ah, no, they're not ready. They're not ready. Trust me, people are ready to be saved. I've, I discovered this in ministry at the, at the mission. There, it's interesting to the, the guys who are there, who are in the program, if they have a court date and they have to go to the courthouse. And here's, here's one of the things they, they want to do. It says, let's walk this way. And say they know the places where some of the homeless people are and they want to walk that way. And they see them sitting on a park bench. They see them gathered uh, in, in, a, in a little area, just sitting on the, on, on the street or something like that, on a corner. And they stop. They'll say, let's stop. And they look at them. And they talk to them. And a lot of times these guys will say, hey, John, how are you doing? And the guys will say, well, I'm going to the courthouse to check in, and here's my chaplain. At the, I'm, at the, I'm in the New Life Discipleship Program at the Mission, and this is my chaplain. Okay? And somebody, one of the guys I'm walking with, when they say that, that's like saying to me, sick them. And I say that in a nice way. Because it presents a wonderful time to share with these guys how they can have their life switched from being lost and lonely out on the street with no aim and purpose. And I give them a card. Got my card. It says, Chaplain. Got my name, telephone number. Chaplain Eureka Rescue Mission. Hand them to them. See? People, by and large, the regular people, so called, in Eureka. Walk right by these people. But not the guys at the mission. They don't walk by them. Because they've been there. They've been there. And someone took the time to look at them and say, come in. You know. Untold stories of guys like, like Brian Hall who came here and shared. And, and I wish some of you could get to know a fellow by the name of Butch. Who, who just was, hey, Butch was just wasted, lived in what they call the devil's playground for two and a half, three or four years, and just came, came in the day use area and was just soaked and wet and strung out and everything like that. And Brian, Brian went out and says to Butch, so what do you think, Butch, is this the time? And Butch knew what he was talking about, and Butch says, I think so. Brian helped him up, put his arm around him, brought him in, got him all situated with clean clothes and everything like that. He came into the program, graduated, and was our house manager for several months. Now he's working as a mechanics helper, making 20 bucks an hour in Eureka. When three years ago, he didn't have a pot to pee in. That's what God can do. That's what God can do. So he says to him, this farmer says to this Levite, um, where are you going? Where do you come from? Where do you come from? And that's what we need to ask people. Where are you going? Where are you headed? Where are you headed? 
I remember, and it's, it's not the approach that I use in talking to somebody. I remember I, I'd been a Christian for about nine months and was, walk, was in Norfolk, Virginia, and I was walking down the, the, the street in Norfolk, Virginia, and I was heading to the serviceman center, and this fellow stopped me. He says, hi, sailor, what's your name? I said, my name's Tom. He says, my name's Keith, Keith Davey. And he said, I got a question for you. If you died right now, where would you go, heaven or hell? Like I said, that's not my approach. But that was Keith, and it worked great for him. And I was so thankful. I said, you know what? I'm going to heaven. I'm going to heaven. And Keith says, really? And I shared, and he got his card, and he says, so where are you headed? I said, I'm, I think that Christian Serviceman Center is in this direction. He says, well, I'm the director down here, and here's where it is. And you go down here and go there. See? That's a question. Only two places a person goes when he dies, heaven or hell. So we've got to decide. And we decide in this life. That's what we tell the guys at the mission. You've got to decide in this life. Don't put it off. Where are you going? Where do you come from? Verse, that's verse 17. Look at verse 18. He said, we're, we're passing from Bethlehem and Judah toward the remote mountains of Ephraim. I, I'm from there. I went to Bethlehem and Ju Judah. Now I'm going to the house of the Lord. But there is no one who will take me into his house. And then he explains to him, I, I got all my own provisions. I don't need, I don't need any, someone to reach out to me and give me a bunch of this and a bunch of that. I got my own provision. All I want is someone to take me into his house. See? By way of application. This is the house. This building is the house. The house of the Lord. And how many people do we know that are crying out, I wish somebody would, in, would invite me to the house would invite me to the house. Do you realize that, that uh, sometimes we're hesitant to invite people to the church and we're afraid to just give it a shot? Hey, how'd, how'd you like to go to church with me? If you've not done that for a while, try it. Try it. I go out in the in the day use area there at the mission. These are guys who aren't in the program. And I sit down and talk to them and I says, have you ever thought about coming into our program? And it's interesting that a lot of the guys who come in the day use area don't know that much about the program that we have, the New Life Discipleship Program. And so I tell the guys that are in the program, get out there and tell these guys what the program's all about. And just ask them. So there it is. You think you'd like to try something like that? Well, maybe I would. Well, follow me. And they come. Tom. And usually they say, this guy's been waiting to talk to you all day. <laughs> and the guy goes, no, I haven't. <laughs> come in and I talk to him. For the most part, a lot of them say, okay. There's no one who will take me into his house. We want to be a people who aren't, a, who aren't afraid to have new people come into the house. We don't want to be exclusive. Exclusive. Oh, you're Lutheran? Sorry, we're Baptists. You can't come in. No. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who what? Whosoever, whosoever. Scripture says, whosoever will can come. Drink of the water of the life freely. Now, let me finish up with verses 20 and 21. Notice the hospitality displayed by this guy. As they were in, no, um, and the old man said, verse 20, peace be with you. However, let all your needs be my responsibility. Only don't spend the night in the open square. 
horrible things happen at night in the, in the open square, in the city square. And we're going to talk about that next week. So he brought him into his house, and he gave fodder to the donkeys, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. So they, they became servants to one another. Washing somebody's dirty feet was, was the utmost task regarding servanthood if you had somebody into your house. See? And so these two guys just, that was some, that was some good fellowship. We had a group of kids, young kids, came to Shelter Cove and, and ministered. And some of the, the gals stayed at our house. And one evening, wasn't it one evening, one of the gals says, Mrs. Colbert, may I wash your feet? Was Nancy uncomfortable? Kind of. But we realized that this young gal wanted to be a servant, was thankful for the fact that they could come out, minister, and, and someone had invited them into their house. And they wanted to express that. Express that. If somebody ever wants to, in the Lord, wash your feet, for God's sake, let them do it. Because if it's in the Lord, they, that's, that's kind of, would you say, kind of one of the utmost things regarding being a servant. Sir. Hospitality displayed by this old man. Let me close with this verse. From the book of Hebrews. Listen to this. Let brotherly love continue. This is from Hebrews chapter 13. Let brotherly love continue. And do not forget to enter to entertain strangers for by doing doing some have unwittingly entertained angels okay remember the prisoners as if chained with them see those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. Part of the body of Christ. Part of our ministry is hospitality and reaching out to those. If you, you some of you may have heard of this book, Dale Evans Rogers, who has since gone to be with the Lord, wife of Roy Rogers, wrote a book called Angels Unaware, where she took in special needs people, kids and raise them. And she says, the one thing that, that hit me when I decided to do that was this, this verse. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Unwittingly simply means without knowing it. You didn't really know that, that you were entertaining an angel. So you never know. You never know. When God touches your heart, and if God touches your heart and you say, I need to invite that person to come to my house or come to church, it's amazing. The guys, we invite guys into the mission. And, and some of those guys walk in and you look at them and you say, gosh, And all of a sudden, they come in and they get saved. Like Ray, the big, tall, skinny, long-haired dude that was here last Sunday. Ray had said to me, it'll be a cold day and you know what, before I come to the mission. And two months later, God put him in a spot where he needed it. And his cousin says, you need to go to the mission, Ray. And she knew very little about the mission. All she knew that it was a place down on 2nd Street that could help her, her cousin. Ray come in and he's doing a great job. We'll graduate right around Thanksgiving.
I had a difficult time trying to figure out an application. And it came to me early this morning, and that, that's it. The fact that, that we just need to lift up our eyes, get our heads out of the sand, and minister to people, minister to people. Diana. Be sure, be sure when it crosses your mind in situations, whether, whatever it is, in, in following, in, in attempting to follow the Lord. If it crosses your mind, I don't have the time. Make sure that that is from the Lord. Because a lot of times, God can make, help you make time. Okay? And a lot of times, we need to, we need to just let, let God help us. See? Let God help us. Say, Lord, you know what I'm thinking. I don't have the time to do this, but you show me. Folks, God will show us if we really want to follow him. That's all I got. What do you have this morning, Pastor? I continue Paul's missionary, first missionary journey, the last half of that journey, and look at some very applicable apologetics. There you go. Hang out. During the next service, we're going to have a good time. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love. Uh, thank you for this portion of Scripture where we can see how this area of Gibeah, the people there didn't reach out to, the, to, to this Levite. And it took somebody who just kind of was probably lodging there temporarily who saw a need, and God used him to meet the need of this Levite. So help us to be like the old guy, to reach out and be hospitable to people in the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.